it is an interesting thing to see Alabama in the national news so consistently over and over again for the past really about two weeks. But of course, it, it has to do with the whole abortion ban is the reason this is going on. But it, it gets to a deeper issue, and I want you to really pay attention to this. There's a clip of Ilhan Omar. She's a freshman senator and also a practicing devout Muslim. That's the reason that she wears the hijab and has the, the whole head covering thing going on while she's serving there in the halls of Congress. And uh, keep in mind that she is a refugee, I believe, from Somalia, if I'm not mistaken. So let's go ahead and take a look at this clip from the congresswoman talking about our state. Religious fundamentalists are currently trying to manipulate state laws in order to impose their beliefs on an entire society, all with complete disregard for voices and the rights of American women. Their recent efforts, like those in Alabama, in Georgia, are only the latest in a long history of efforts to criminalize women's, women for simply existing, to punish us when we don't conform to their attempts to control us. But because it's happening here with the support of the ultra-conservative religious right, we call it religious freedom. It's simply unthinkable. Let's just be honest. For the religious right, this isn't simply about their care or concern for life. If they cared about or were concerned about children, they would be concerned about the children that are being detained and those that are dying in camps across our borders. Or the children who are languishing in hunger and facing homelessness. This isn't about religious mora morality or conviction because we've seen time and time again those that talk about their faith and want to push policies because of their faith are the ones that simply are caught with the hypocrisy of not living it out in their personal lives. I am frustrated every single time I hear people speaking about their faith and pushing that onto other people. Because we know those so-called religious politicians, when it comes to their life, their choices, they want to talk about freedom. But when it comes to other people's lives and other people's choices, they want to talk about religion. All right, so that again is the execrable... <laughs> Ilhan Omar, uh, going after the state of Alabama. First of all, just a quick observation. Omar is a garbage speaker. As a public speaker, she is awful. Because you'll notice if you're watching that clip, and I say this is somebody that spends a, a great deal of his time preparing remarks and then delivering them to people. This is my job. I do it every single day. That Ilhan Omar... She has to look down, look up, look down, look up, look down, look up. I mean, it happens all the time, and she has to read everything word for word. Whenever she reaches the end of what she was saying, she has to look back down and then talk about it and then look back up. Keep in mind, this happens in the general speeches portion of Congress. In other words, she wasn't debating a specific bill. She was making a general speech, which means she was allotted five minutes. In five minutes' time, she couldn't even memorize her speech enough, and she has to do it verbatim. She has to do it right off the manuscript. That's why she gets tripped up and gets very, very um, pointed about making sure that she, she says every word correct. For example, you'll notice there she said woman's, and then she said women's right to exist. See, she read it as plural as opposed to possessive, and it tripped her up. And she had to go back and correct herself because she knows the rest of the sentence will be grammatically incorrect if she doesn't. She can't ad-lib. She's not quick on her feet. She's really not that bright. She's just reading things off of a script. And you can tell she not only doesn't know her speech, that she cannot deviate from the script at all. She has to read everything word for word because she can't really think that quickly when she's up there and having to actually communicate with people. And again, 
This is a five minute speech. I was literally giving five minute speeches, actually minutes, uh, speeches longer than five minutes since I was, oh, about 11 or 12. And by the way, just to give you a example of this, these are my notes for the show. These two pages. And then that poem that I read at the top of the show. This will keep me going for an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Just an outline. Nothing special, nothing fancy. You can see them right there. That's my notes for an hour-long show. First of all, and this was the main thing, she kept saying that because the religious right is the one pushing these abortion bans, we call it religious liberty. Who calls it that? Who? Can you cite somebody? Seriously, because religious liberty is a really big deal to me. I think that anybody that's been any time watching this program or following my career understands that pretty well. I'm a minister. I take religious liberty very seriously. I do not know a single person that is saying because of religious liberty, abortions ought to be banned. I know very few people, even though they do exist, that are saying because my religion teaches abortion is wrong, then abortion should be banned. There are at least that, but what she's saying here is the people are saying we need to ban abortions because of religious liberty. No, no one's saying that. You're straw manning here. There is nobody that I'm aware of, no serious person on the right whatsoever, whether you're talking about politicians, whether you're talking about pundits or commentators like myself. I do not know of any single person on the right that is saying religious liberty, therefore we should ban abortion. That doesn't even make sense. Even if you believe that your abortion, uh, that, that your religion taught against abortion and that that was the basis for you saying that it should be illegal, that's still technically not religious liberty. And so I don't really get what she's going for here. Religious liberty is the ability for you to practice your religion and to not be inhibited by the government in doing so. It says nothing about things like abortion. That's not religious liberty. And here's another thing that she says, too. She says, this is just about them trying to control women. This is just about them trying to control you. All people that are pro-life are saying, all that is being said here is if you, your bad decision does not justify harming another person. That's all we're saying. Like I've said before, I'm not trying to control a woman's body. I'm wanting her to control her own body and a man to control his own body so that unwanted pregnancies don't happen, that they do things responsibly. But if they do choose, if they do make a choice, and I think that they should be free to make that choice, even if it's a bad decision, that you're free to make that choice, but you also have to live with the consequences. That you also have to live with the outcome of your choices. You're free to make bad decisions if you want but you bear that responsibility. And you making a bad decision and acting irresponsibly is not a justification for hurting another person. For example, let's take drunk driving. Let's apply Ilhan Omar's logic to drunk driving. How dare you try to control my body? I'm putting the alcohol in my body and then I'm taking my car and driving it home. How dare you try to control me? Well, the reason we're not trying to control you we're just saying that if you made a bad decision to get drunk, and if you made a much worse decision to drive while drunk, then yes, we are going to penalize and arrest you because you broke the law and did something that could hurt another person. You see, once you involve another person, then all of a sudden, your freedom has to take a back seat. If you are acting recklessly in a way that is very likely to harm another person, then the law has to say, nope, you can't just act recklessly like that. You can't make bad decisions if they're going to hurt someone else. And keep in mind, in the analogy of drunk driving, this is just something that is likely to harm somebody else. In an abortion, every successful abortion ends in a death. Every single time. And unfortunately, there are now people like the governor of Virginia that are saying, even in an unsuccessful abortion where someone actually winds up living, then we should still be able to consider maybe we kill them then when we didn't succeed the first time trying to kill them. We are living in a very dark time where the sanctity of life has just been completely thrown out of the way. So finally, 
let's get to her final claim that Christians don't really believe what they believe or they would be helping kids at the border and helping hungry kids. That's really the crux of what she's claiming here. But here's the truth. This is an obvious attempt, a very obvious, blatant attempt, to try to obscure the fact that they don't care about kids. This is a red herring fallacy. What she's trying to do is she's throwing this out to her to try to distract from the fact that they don't care whether the children in the womb live or die. That's what's happening. She's trying to throw that out there so you can distract from the fact that they're saying, we think you should be able to kill the kids in the womb. That's the only reason they're bringing this up. But even if you believe the kids in cages narrative, which we've debunked several times, we'll talk about it a little bit in a second. Even if you believe this narrative that there were no cages beforehand, everybody was fine, immigrants were coming in, they were being treated well, there was no problems, and all the kids were living in mansions while they were waiting on their court hearings, even if you believe that ridiculous piece of fiction. And then big bad Trump came in, and he said, you know what, we're going to put them in cages and feed them like dogs, which is not what happened. He continued the policies of the previous administration. But anyway, even if you believe that stupid narrative that is easily disprovable, even if you thought that was true, it's still not killing kids. Treating them badly? Yes. Would that be a bad thing? Sure. Are they being murdered? No. And so let's not treat these things as though it's a one-to-one -one comparison. Even if you ignore the fact that it's a complete red herring fallacy, even if you ignore the fact that this entire narrative is based on lies, based on this idea that Trump changed things from the way that they were before Obama was, and that they are really being treated inhumanely, even if you believe that fiction, there's still a big difference between mistreating children and killing children. You're also dealing with the fact that they're working with limited funding, largely due to the Democrats, I might add. And so they're having to do the best that they can to throw this stuff together to stem the tide that's going through there. If you have a thousand extra kids show up one particular day, you can't just build the building instantly. This isn't Fortnite or, or some kind of uh, like roller coaster tycoon or something, or Age of Empires, where you can just build a new structure in 15 seconds. Back in 2014, which, by the way, who is that dude that was president back then? Oh, yeah, Barack Obama. There was an influx of immigrants coming through in 2014. There were so many that they were running out of beds. They were having trouble feeding them. And so we raised, and by we, I mean Mercury One. I did some work with them. That's Glenn Beck's organization. Me and other American Christians many of whom do not agree with open borders and want there to be a wall and extra security measures and to stop the influx of illegal immigration, many of us, even though we believe that, gave a lot of our own hard-earned money to get teddy bears and soccer balls and meals to these kids because just because they were in violation of the law or their parents told them to do that or their parents brought them over here, it doesn't mean we don't care about the kids. And that's another thing that the left refuses to talk about. That there have been multiple efforts by people, even on the right, conservative religious Americans, that have done a lot to help these kids out. There are churches on the border right now helping these kids out. That doesn't mean you don't care about the kids. And we've got to quit playing this game of, if you're not in favor of full-on open borders, then it's because you hate children. No, that's not it. Just because we want our laws to be obeyed does not mean we have any animosity for the people that want to break the law. We don't want them to break the law, obviously. We want to hold them accountable for their actions. But that's not the same thing as saying you hate the person on the other side. The reason that we want armed robbery, for example, to be illegal is not because we hate people that may consider armed robbery. It's because we care about the people in our family and in our home that could be hurt. And that's something that the left continues to intentionally ignore, especially when you consider that they were not outraged about these exact same policies happening when it was President Barack Obama doing it. 
what's funny about all this is a lot of these problems that they're bringing up, they are the result, they are the offspring, as it were, of bad liberal policies. There are a lot of leftist judges and an awful lot of leftist Democrats in Congress like her that opposed extra spending at the border, beefing up security, the security measures that would keep more kids from coming in so that we could get the ones that we have here now under control and extra funding for the facilities down there. You see, the Democrats want it to look bad. They want it to look overcrowded. They want it to look inhumane because that scores political points from them. And what have they been doing since then? Blocking funds to these facilities. They don't care about the kids. They care about a political win. And it absolutely disgusts me that somebody like Ilhan Omar is trying to blame the right when it's her party and their policies that have been causing the crisis in the first place. Think about this. Under the worldview, under the design, under the desire, the policy recommendations of those on the right, these kids would never be put in these facilities in the first place because they would still be, by the way, not separated with their families in their home country. And if they want to come to, the, to America, by all means, apply. Do it through legal channels. That's all we're asking for. That is all we're saying. They're trying to conflate this with hatred of the kids, and it's just not. You see, it's the sanctuary cities and the generous benefits that are drawing the families here in the first place. It's the Democrat policies that caused this problem. And they refuse to clean it up because they think that they can score a political win from it. They don't mind who they hurt as long as they win when it comes to politics. The best thing that could happen for these kids is to secure the border and to fund ICE and to fund the Border Patrol the way that they should be. That's what's actually going to help the kids. And for Ilhan Omar to say, well, you religious people, you just care about children in the womb and you don't care about the children in the border. No, we care about both. You're the one that doesn't. Oh, hey, what are you still doing here? Video's over. I'm off the clock. So go watch another one of my videos or something. Or better yet, you could subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell. And if you do that, then you'll get a notification when I actually am on the air and you can watch me then. In the meantime, I'm going to take a nap.